Welcome back, friends. John Eldridge here on the Ransomed Heart Podcast in the week of April 27th. And this is the second part, part two, of an interruption in a series that we were doing about how to listen to someone's story, how to tell your own story that we are going to get back to. But we interrupted this uh, to talk more about the global situation. And so uh, since this is part two, if you didn't hear part one, you probably want to go back and listen to last week's first and then pick up with that. Why the interruption? Well, because this is not a small passing thing. This is a big deal. A crisis on this scale, as I said last week, ought to have the friends of Jesus seeking him very intimately right now. What are you doing, Lord? Where are we in the story? What's happening? How should we be interpreting this? How should we be praying? So it's with that in mind that I want to offer a part two. First, just by way of review, one of the main points I was trying to make last week was simply that this is a shaking, like the scripture often talks about, but it is a shaking on a massive scale. I mean, there's hardly a person on the planet now who is not affected by it or who won't eventually be affected by it, and billions of people are going to be affected by it very profoundly. More on that in a moment. And what I was pointing out, both as a therapist for 30 years and from my own personal life, also from the scriptures, is that God uses disruption, sometimes massive disruption, to address the things in our hearts and in our world that need addressing in order to recapture our hearts. And that's the critical point. It is always about the rescue, the redemption, the capturing of the human heart for God. So let me start with something from Ezekiel 14. Some of the elders of Israel came to me and sat down in front of me, Ezekiel wrote, and then the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, these men have set up idols in their hearts and put wicked stumbling blocks before their faces. Should I let them inquire of me at all? Therefore speak to them and tell them this is what the sovereign Lord says when any of my people sets up an idol in their heart and puts a wicked stumbling block before their faces. And then they go to a prophet. I, the Lord, will answer them in keeping with their great idolatry. I will do this to recapture the hearts of the people who have all deserted me for their idols. Therefore, say to the people of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says, repent. Turn from your idols, and then the people of Israel will no longer stray from me, nor will they defile themselves anymore with all their sins. They will be my people, and I will be their God, declares the Sovereign Lord. I love that passage. I love verse 5, where he says, I am doing this to recapture the hearts of the people. Last week, I confessed the story, uh, the inside story of getting thrown from a horse uh, a number of years ago, breaking both my wrists, having my normal stripped from me. And that's what's happened for all of us and for the world. We've had so much of our normal stripped from us. And last week I was talking about the accident Though I don't think God threw me from the horse, and I don't think God, you know, deliberately brought about this pandemic, debating that's not the point. What I'm saying is God sure used it. There's no question he was in it that in my life, uh, getting thrown from a horse, having both arms in cast for three months was so disruptive and it was so revealing. It revealed and exposed my independence. It revealed and exposed the message that I was giving to my dear wife and the damage I was doing to my marriage and my friendships and 
honestly, even my health in just a very driven, independent lifestyle. So this is one of the great tools of God, disruption and shaking. And this particular moment on the planet is very disruptive. And what I asked last week was first of us to personally consider what is it revealing? Our dear Jesus says things to us like, don't worry about tomorrow. You know, he's teaching about the Father's heart and how much he loves us and how good he is. As he was teaching us about prayer. He said, don't worry about tomorrow. Well, how's that going? <laughs> uh-huh. How's that going? What has the pandemic and the economic fallout revealed to us about our ability to not worry about tomorrow? And what does that reveal to us about our faith? Throughout the scripture, Old and New Testament, God continually pleads for us not to turn to our other comforters. He says, please let me comfort you. How's that been gone? <laughs> I'm just embarrassed by how much I am turning to my other comforters and how much I am worrying about tomorrow. And then a remarkable passage in Peter where he says, set your hope fully on the grace to be given to you when Jesus Christ returns. And how's that going? Like, what has the shaking, what is the uncertain future? What is some of the very, very disappointing and heartbreaking news revealed about where our hopes are? Okay. If this is revealing things in us that needed revealing, I mean, if this is a shaking, it's a pretty severe one. But what I was trying to point out last week is that in the developed world all over globally, we have lost every sense of dependence on God. I mean, really, compare your life to the life of the average human being for thousands of years, the life of everyone in the Old and New Testament at the time of its writing, you know, just look at the dependence that the average person and the average farmer had upon food production. Like, we desperately needed to pray that the rain would come and water the crops when we needed that, the spring and summer rains. We desperately needed to pray for good weather. We desperately needed God to fend off early frost or the damage of hail. So the average farmer and the average person was in a daily experience of utter dependency on God. And that reality so shapes the Old Testament, the Psalms, the Proverbs, so shapes the New Testament, Jesus's view of the world. And you compare that to what life has been for most of us in the developed world. We could book a flight anywhere we wanted from our phones. We could travel whenever we wanted. We didn't even think really twice about that. We could order food from any sort of cuisine in our own city. You want Korean food? You know, you can get it. Thai food? No problem. Italian? Easy peasy. Not only that, but you could have someone deliver it to your door. You could go shopping whenever you wanted. Pretty much be absolutely assured that what you wanted at the grocery store would be there. You go to the dentist whenever you wanted and get good care. We could get any form of medical care. You could drop your kids off at school and know that they would be well cared for, protected, educated. I mean, just like compare this hour of comfort on the earth and what it did to our sense of dependency on God and how much, frankly, people were grateful to God for our blessings and how much they felt the need to pray to God, to look to God. Right. As I was sharing the story, the parable that Jesus told about the man who builds bigger barns, you know, a life of ease and comfort numbs the soul to God. And then thinking a little bit more about the era that we grew up in, what we've all been operating in, the air we breathe, the Kool-Aid we've been drinking. Think about what irritates you, especially 
you know, pre-pandemic, but also what's getting revealed in the pandemic. Like when your computer takes more than a few seconds to boot up, don't you just get irritated at that? It's like, come on, 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 come on. Or if it needed to install something and you had, you know, the overnight update. So you open up in the morning, it says, oops, you know, it needs a few minutes to install these uh, fixes. And then it takes three or seven minutes and you're just drumming your fingers, tapping the desk, go get a cup of coffee. <laughs> like the things that we would get irritated at when you lose a cell signal driving through town, you know, you're on a call with someone and you go into one of those cell holes and it drops off. Just remember your irritation at that. Okay. When your flight was delayed an hour. Oh my goodness. Friends, we, we've all grown up in a very comfortable culture, unlike any the world has ever known. And so what I was saying last week is that this world needed shaking. Humanity so easily abandons their creator God, their loving father, their savior Jesus for the idols that we create, idols that give us a sense of life, a sense of security, idols that give us hope for our future, idols that give us control, and idols that give us comfort, but also idols that give us meaning. Let me read from Jeremiah chapter 2. You can hear the heart of God about this. Cross over to the coasts and look. Send to Kedar and observe closely. See if there has ever been anything like this. Has a nation ever changed its gods? But my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. Be appalled at this, you heavens, and shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. My people have committed two sins. And you're like, whoa, whoa, like be appalled, shudder with great horror, two sins. What is it? You know, is this going to be human sacrifice? Like what? Here's what he names. My people have committed two sins. Jeremiah chapter 2, 13. They have forsaken me, a spring of living water and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. <laughs> and you kind of go, that's it? Yeah, that's it. That's the big deal. It is the normal human experience of turning everywhere but God for life and love and goodness and joy for security and a sense of a future. So God is always vying for the human heart, and what makes it so difficult is how easily we slip into idols, other lovers, false comforters. And so the big idea from last time was that God is always vying for, fighting for, alluring, wooing, winning, rebuking, trying to win the human heart out of its many places of bondage. That's the great battle. I said the world has always been at war, and the human heart has always been the prize. So even in times of relative peace and comfort, we must always evaluate our hour on the earth from the battle for the human heart. I mean, just asking, how is the gospel doing? Are people coming to Christ? How is humanity doing? How are the people of God doing? Are they in deep, alert partnership? with God. And I'll confess, one of the concerns that I have had, that I have just very gently tried to point out, is I think the people of God have been somewhat like the disciples asleep in Gethsemane, even during this pandemic, you know, just enjoying Netflix, getting takeout, talking about what a wonderful time this is. And that is not evaluating things from the larger story. That's not evaluating things from how is the gospel doing globally? How is the fight for the human heart going? Because we are the friends of Jesus. We are the friends of Jesus. It is the best possible role in any story ever. We are the intimate allies of God. We are the restored 
sons of Adam and daughters of Eve join together in the last hours of the age to contend with the forces of hell for humanity and for the human heart. What I said last week was, I said, I think we have an incredible window for the gospel right now. And, and since saying that, I've been reading some wonderful signs of it. Friends, the good news, the things that are unfolding are very exciting. I was reading the blog of the pastor and evangelist, Greg Laurie, and he was saying what's been happening in their church. He said, uh, quoting from his blog, we already had an online version of our church service that was beginning to grow. Before COVID-19 crisis, around 8,000 people viewed it each week. The first week we went exclusively online, that number skyrocketed to 250,000 people. The following week, 350,000 people tuned in. And the one after that, 634,000. Last Sunday, we had 1.3 million people watching our live stream. But here's the most significant indication we may be on the verge of a spiritual awakening. I'm quoting from his blog. In those past four weeks, we have seen over 21,000 people indicate their desire to put their faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. This is unprecedented, Greg Laurie writes. We've only seen that kind of response through our crusades. And so I left you last time with a call to prayer, right? Joining us in two things, praying for an outpouring of the revelation of Jesus in the world praying for it every day. And then I encouraged you to pick three people in your world and begin to pray for them daily, that they may come to know Jesus, an aunt, a neighbor, someone from work. I encouraged us all to make this the main thing we are doing with our shelter at home, period. And I just want to ask, how's that going? Was that easy to sustain? over these past seven days or or however long it's been between your listening of these two podcasts? Is that revealing some things about how you're doing and what your hopes are set on, what your priorities are? Okay, so this week, as I closed last week's podcast, I said I did want to talk more about where are we now in the story of God? Is there more that we can understand? Is there more that we can prepare for? And I think there is. And in order to get us into what I want to cover this week, I just want to ask you first, what is the story that you are telling yourself around all this? What is the story that you are accepting or believing or living in or assuming around all this? Let me suggest a couple of the popular storylines that I have heard recently. A very popular one is, this is a rough time, we'll get over soon. And the appeal of it, oh my gosh, the number of people that I have heard say something like, man, I'm sure looking forward to life getting back to normal. And I see it in my own heart. I am the first one to raise my hand. It's a really attractive story. And to be merciful, humanity needs a sense of normal. We need a sense of equilibrium. We're not meant to live in a constant state of uncertainty. But if that's the story we're living in, I'll tell you what, man, that is a really small story. It's almost a chosen naivete. And it sure reveals what we're living for, right? Let's just get back to our lives. Completely ignores the war for the human heart. It ignores the extraordinary moment we are in, and it really ignores seeking Jesus about what he's up to. It's a chosen naivete, really. Because for one thing, there is no sign that this is going to be resolved quickly. And in fact, I don't know if you've noticed, whether it's the medical community or the various leaders around the world are sending hints right now. Governor of Colorado was hinting in a recent press conference here in our state that parents and educators ought to be prepared for schools not to open until January. 
whoa, like that is a brutal turn of events for all those moms who are stuck at home, especially those single moms. What do they do? How do they go back to work? So there's no sign right now that this is going to be a quick resolve and an easy fix and the economy is just going to bounce right back and everything's going to be fine again. So the storyline that, hey, this is just a rough time we'll get over soon, I think is a pretty naive story to be living in. And for the friends of God, for the restored sons of Adam and daughters of Eve, it's a, it's a really, really small story. Another storyline that's been very popular that I've just kind of gently been trying to question is, this is a wonderful reset, right? A friend of mine was just recently was telling me about his brother High power attorney, New York guy, you know, running a jillion miles an hour, involved in big, important things, making loads of money and dying inside. And the pandemic has just caused a major, major change in his life. And he's rediscovering the simple things. He's rediscovering his faith, which is a good thing. But this idea of, hey, this is a wonderful reset. We're all kind of learning a simpler life. I want to say, yep, yep. There are some people who have been enjoying this immensely. Yep, that's true. There are some. But very quickly and very humbly, we need to acknowledge not everyone. In fact, not most people. Our single friends who love God and who love others, they're having a really hard time in this. They're hurting. They're alone. They're isolated. They're not sitting on their deck, sipping drinks and playing board games. And in the war for the human heart, this storyline, this is a wonderful reset, really concerns me. Just think about it for a moment. Think about this outcome in the life of one person. You know, the man perhaps that I was just talking about who has run to the pace of modern life, you know, the person who now finds themselves in a far healthier rhythm is actually a man or woman in desperate danger. Because before the reset, they were at least suffering the consequences of their sin. And that suffering might have made them hungry for a savior God. But now, if we all just return back after this wonderful reset, now they've found balance. They're happier without needing God one bit. After the crisis is over, they return to their former life, but with a healthier lifestyle, and they are twice as fit for hell, doubly damned, because they're even more insulated against their need for Jesus Christ. I mean, friends, have you been watching the news? As the restrictions are lifting in China, there is a divorce boom. Uh, the divorce offices got rushed. The, the various legal departments couldn't even handle the number of people showing up in their offices. As soon as these people were allowed to leave their apartments, they rushed straight for divorces. And the reports that I was seeing on this, um, they're saying this is an ominous sign of what's coming for Europe and America. Did you see the report last week from the UN director of the World Food Program saying that we could be facing multiple famines of biblical proportions within a few short months in a number of underdeveloped countries? And this is horrible. This is absolutely devastating. I mean, I will guarantee you this. God did not allow this massive global disruption so that people would learn to take more walks. And so a wonderful reset is not a good storyline to be living in for the friends of God. Let me read from Hebrews 12. He says, be careful that you do not refuse to listen to the one who is speaking. For if the people of Israel did not escape when they refused to listen to Moses, the earthly messenger, we will certainly not escape if we reject the one who speaks to us from heaven. When God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth. But now he makes another promise. Quote, once again, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. This means that all of creation will be shaken and removed so that only unshakable things will remain. And Hebrews 12 closes with this line, since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, 
Let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. And so when you see something that sure looks like a global shaking, maybe the shaking, revealing all that can be shaken, it ought to get, it ought to get your attention big time, right? This is far more than a, a nice reset. And so I know you've been waiting for me to get to my point. Where do I think this fits in God's story? And I want to begin to just give us some, some basic interpretive tools. Like, what is it that we believe? What is the Christian take on where things are headed and how, how we know? And I just want to first point out, we don't believe that the world just comes together as one big loving family and figures out how to solve all its problems and things just get better and better until Jesus comes back to a world that barely recognizes his coming because it really doesn't need saving at all. That's not the Christian story, right? Throughout the scripture, we understand that things are heading to a climax. Things don't just go on and on. Things are racing towards a climax, something called the day of the Lord, the end of the age. Here is one of many of Jesus' teachings on this from Matthew 13. Here is another story Jesus told. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But that night, as the workers slept, his enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat and then slipped away. When the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew. The farmer's workers went to him and said, Sir, the field where you planted that good seed is full of weeds. Where did they come from? An enemy has done this, the farmer exclaimed. Should we pull out the weeds, they asked? No, he replied. You'll uproot the wheat if you do. Let both grow together until the harvest. And then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds, tie them into bundles and burn them, and to put the wheat in the barn. And then a little bit later in Matthew 13, he offers the interpretation. His disciples ask him, what does that mean? And Jesus says, the son of man is the farmer who plants the good seed. The field is the world. And the good seed represents the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people who belong to the evil one. The enemy who planted the weeds among the wheat is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, the end of the age. And the harvesters are the angels. Just as the weeds are sorted out and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the world. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will remove from his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. And the angels will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then the righteous will shine like the sun in their Father's kingdom. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. The end of the age. The massive intervention, the settling of all accounts, the sheep and the goats, right? Those who want to go with Jesus, go with him into the joys of a restored heaven and earth. Those who do not want that world are allowed to go where they choose, which is an eternity far from God. Now, the thing is this, that at some point, some generation is that generation. Someday, is that day. Some hour is that hour. The important thing to remember is this story does not just go on and on. The friends of Jesus believe and rejoice in the fact that this story is hurling towards a climax, the day of the Lord, the end of the age, and the opening chapter of the new age, the new era, the new hour, right? The scriptures urge us both to look forward to that day with eagerness and to pray for it and to assume that it might be our generation that sees it. Now, the scriptures also encourage us to read the times. Matthew 16, one day the Pharisees and Sadducees came to test Jesus, demanding that he show them a miraculous sign from heaven to prove his authority. 
parentheses, may I point out that he's been doing that for the past, you know, 14 chapters. Anyhow, Jesus replied, Matthew 16, verse 2, you know the saying, red sky at night means fair weather tomorrow. Red sky in the morning means foul weather all day. You know how to interpret the weather signs in the sky, but you don't know how to interpret the signs of the times. I mean, there, there is a rebuke in his voice that they don't know how to interpret the signs of the times. And then in Matthew 24, which we'll get back to in just a moment, as Jesus is beginning to describe some of the symptoms and signs of the swelling of all this to a climax and, and of the very last hours, he says, now learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things, you can know that my return is very near, right at the door. The point being is that we're invited to pay attention. We're invited to be alert. We're invited to look for it. And as I said before about the Hebrews 12 shaking, you know, when you see a global shaking that is revealing you know, the massive idolatries of the world, that kind of thing should get our attention. Last week, I quoted Luke 19 uh, about how God yearns, longs, does everything he possibly can to win the human heart, including through massive hardship. And so this is Jesus as he's approaching Jerusalem. He saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another. And then listen to this, because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. So here was God himself coming to give his life for humanity and the very people that claimed to know God in that era, the very religious scholars and leaders couldn't even recognize him when he stood before them. We are urged to look for it. We are urged to live in such a way that our hour might be the hour we are. This is the perspective of the story. Things are hurling towards a wonderful, massive climax and a massive intervention. Now, I am not an end times expert, but I do want to point out to you some basic things. In Matthew 24, Jesus, as he begins to describe some of the signs of the ends, he says, nation will go to war against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all this is only the first or the beginning of birth pains. So we have this idea of like a woman in childbirth, the world, the Earth itself, as well as human society, will experience birth pangs. And it, it, man, if you've just been paying attention, anybody who cares about this dear planet, you know, if you've been paying attention to weather patterns and the increase in the number of earthquakes and tsunamis in the 21st century, the loss of animal life and animal species. I was, reading a PBS thing by a university professor from Tennessee talking about that many, many biologists believe that we are in the midst of a mass extinction. I mean, we are losing animal species every single day. Around 1 million animal and plant species are now threatened with extinction, many within decades. And so the earth, the earth is sure showing signs of awful birth pangs, right? The aching, the groaning, the quaking. And you may have seen the reports by Stephen Hawking saying he thinks the earth has a hundred years. Now, I'm not saying that I'm a huge Stephen Hawking fan, and I don't want to get lost in details around debating one scientist against another. And this isn't a debate about global warming. Okay, we could get lost down in the weeds on that. But the point is, 
the earth is groaning. The earth is aching. We do seem to be in the throes of birth pains in a number of, of ways that we are witnessing on the earth, especially at the close of the 21st century and the opening of this. A friend just sent a message today that in Africa, the pandemic has come on top of the first major plague of locusts in recent memory. People's crops were already decimated. And then you add the tribal unrest in various nations, the Muslim extremist activities, the insurgents. Like You look around the world and you go, this sure looks like birth pains to me. They sure could be, is the point. And the fact that it's so global and so sweeping does get our attention. But I think there's even a greater sign. In Matthew 24, verse 14, Jesus sums it all up. And he says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. And obviously, anyone who's spent time in any sort of missionary focused church or environment. I mean, this is what the major missionary moves of Christendom have been about, is we've got to get the gospel out to all nations because we care and love the human race. And because Peter says in that way, we hasten, we actually accelerate. It's right there in scripture. We accelerate the coming of the Lord. And now what's very interesting is I'm not a missionary expert. And, and again, these are, you know, the point is not to debate the minutia of this, but the missionary leaders that I am in fellowship with tell me that because of funding, because of technology, because of access, that task of getting the gospel of the kingdom to every tribe and tongue and nation could very well be achieved in the next 20 years. I've heard some say 10. I've heard some say five. And so do you see the birth pangs? Certainly. My goodness, the 21st century, World War I, World War II, Vietnam, Korea, Afghanistan. Then you see the aching of the earth itself. You see the birth pangs, no question. And then the even greater sign is the gospel reaching all nations. So let's just say for a moment that we are very near the return of Jesus. It certainly is possible. It's highly possible. And the scripture actually urges us to act like it. How does that make you feel? What are your honest thoughts about that? Do you have goosebumps right now? Does it just send a thrill through your body? Or is there kind of a oh, ambivalence? Is there a, maybe a sick feeling down kind of in the pit of your gut. Because here's another fascinating thing. One of the signs of the intimate return of Jesus is that the people of God are highly desiring and crying out for it. The very last book of the Bible, the very close of the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, Jesus says, look, I am coming soon. Okay, so again, I just want to point out, if they thought it was soon 2,000 years ago, you know, we are in the last seconds of it. He says, look, I'm coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes. They will be permitted to enter through the gates of the city and eat the fruit from the tree of life. Outside the city are all the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idol worshipers, and all who love to live a lie. That's back to what is the story that people are clinging to. Going on, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to you, to give you this message for the churches, I am both the source of David and the heir to his throne. I am the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears this say, come. Let anyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who desires drink freely from the water of life. 
Oh my goodness. And then he goes on with a warning not to add or take away to anything that's written in this book. And then it closes with, he who is the faithful witness to all these things says, yes, I'm coming soon. And the response is, amen, come Lord Jesus. So you see the bride crying out for the return of Jesus at the end. And I think one of the significant movements we've watched in the last 30 years has been the remarkable worship that's been coming out in the church. Those of us who came to Christ in the, in the 60s and 70s and the Jesus movement and in the charismatic renewal in the Catholic Church, you remember the songs. You know, they were, they were pretty basic, you know. And that was the era of Kumbaya, among other songs. That, that's not to mock it. It was wonderful worship, and I loved it, and I, we loved Jesus. But my goodness, the worship that has been pouring forth out of the church and the world in the last, really even in the last 20 years, has just been powerful and rich and intimate and invoking. So what I'm saying is one of the signs is the bride is crying out for it. And back in Matthew 23, I read this last time. Uh, Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you. How often I've longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And what's really cool is there's a rich, vibrant Christian community of both Jews and Arabs living together, loving one another in fellowship, crying out in Jerusalem, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But what I'm pointing out is that the church globally should be saying that, crying out for it, wanting it. And so as I've been praying into these things, as I've been preparing some notes for you, like thinking through the shaking, thinking through what it's revealing, looking at how serious this thing could really get. I mean, global famines, it would just be awful, not globally, but in underdeveloped places where the, already there are food shortages showing up in places like Pakistan and India and in and, and places in Africa. Like, but that would be horrible. That would be awful. So praying into it, asking God what's going on, looking at the shaking of Hebrews uh, 12, wanting to prepare my words to you today. And, and, and Jesus asked us all a fascinating question as I was praying. He said, well, do you want me to come? What is it that we want? What is it that we are secretly hoping for? And again, I think we need to be really honest about this um, because it doesn't help to just kind of sort of quickly say, oh, yes, of course. Like, I just noticed my, you know, response. Stace and I have sat down and watched a few of the press conferences, you know, announcing first the restrictions and then announcing what looks like the beginning, the very, very beginning of the lifting of the restrictions. And, you know, my heart just, oh, maybe we will get that family vacation this summer after all. And I'm going, okay, John, like, that's good. That's good to have those hopes. But you haven't reacted like that to much else during this crisis. That hope that suddenly springs up, the thrill, the goosebumps. It's like, really? Where are my hopes set? What is it that we are secretly hoping for? And then I, I asked you to be praying last week. I said I would. And can we all just admit how hard it was to stay focused on praying for three people in our life every day, on praying for a global revival? We are a distracted people who are used to our other comforters. And Jesus is asking, well, do you want me to come? What's your heart towards that? The other thing that I mentioned at the close of last week's, I wanted to say a little bit more about now, and, and all of this is coming together into kind of one, one cohesive thing, is that we have a sense that this moment that we're in right now is a dress rehearsal. As I was praying about the pandemic, I felt the Father say that he would have mercy. And it appears that we may be seeing some of the signs of that mercy now, reports are good. Reports are that there is a leveling off in many places and a decline 
There's even some places that are reporting no new hospitalizations, no new incidences of COVID-19. So there's been there's been good signs. But as I was praying about that, Stacy, we felt that the father also say this was a dress rehearsal. And several folks that I've talked to who've been praying hard into it have felt that as well. And it could be simply because more waves of COVID-19 are going to hit. Uh, it's very likely that that happens possibly late summer or this fall. It's certainly not unlikely. And then what will that do? You know, is it another round? It could be because the economic fallout is going to have far greater repercussions than we know. Certainly, if the food shortages in certain places in the world really start causing devastation, that will be awful. It could be because more birth pains are upon us. But in terms of a dress rehearsal, there's no reason to believe that what we're going to see is a very quick finish to all this and a complete bounce back which is why it is so important for us to take a look at what this has revealed in us. What will change? What have we learned? What is this revealing in us? Are we willing to exchange one kind of worldly comfort for another, for a heavenly comfort? And then Jesus took me to Matthew 25. I'm asking some of these questions of myself because I know, uh, just reading any of the history of revivals, either in the scriptures or in church history, it always begins with the house of God, begins with our hearts. And so Matthew 25, uh, this is obviously one long conversation. It's a flow. You know, he's warned about the end of the age in Matthew 24. He's told us to watch for it. He's told us to assume that it could be any moment. And then in Matthew 25, he tells the parable of the bridesmaids. The kingdom of heaven will be like 10 bridesmaids. He actually says, then, then, meaning kind of in this last hour, last minutes, last seconds, then the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough oil their lamps. But the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. I just, two things there. Like, Jesus admits several times, like in the parable of the persistent widow and other places, it looks like he's delaying. He admits that here. He says the bridegroom doesn't seem to come quickly. Like, we Church has been crying out for this for 2,000 years now. The bridegroom was delayed, and I just appreciate him saying that. And then they all became drowsy and fell asleep like the disciples in Gethsemane. You know, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And let us not become drowsy at the wheel here. At midnight, they were all roused by the shout, look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, "Ah, please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, we don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop, buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast. And the door was locked. Later, when the other five returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. So you two must keep watch, for you do not know the day or hour of my return. There is a readiness that we need to have in this hour on the earth. There is a willingness to endure hardship in order to get back to the partnering with God and the shaking on the earth. We want to see a great revival. We want to see many hearts as can be one, one here. This story is not, let's get back to our lives as quick as we can. I sure hope the schools open quickly. Of course, we want those things, but that's not the main story. 
things are racing towards a finish, a great climax. That is the Christian story. Things are racing towards the finish. And we are to be alert and expectant and watching and rejoicing over that fact. So let's just say for a moment, let's just say for a moment that we are very, very close. I mean, the the missionary task could be fulfilled in five years, friends. Let's say we are very, very close in our lifetime at least. How would that inform us? Just kind of let your heart go there for a minute. Go, holy cow. Okay, so let me just kind of go with that. We are very, very close. You know, five years, 10 years, our lifetime. Wow. Two things present themselves to me right away. Like I can feel my heart going, oh, well, I I don't need to hold on to things as tightly. You know, grasp my finances, not grasp my vacation plans, not, frankly, not grasp at anything. Like, wow. Wow. Uh, there's a freedom to it. And then, the, oh gosh, my next thing that comes so quickly on that is, oh Jesus, I pray for every heart that can be rescued to be rescued. And I, I have been praying for the return of Jesus for years, passionately. But at the same time, I, I also feel, the, I feel this, the, the heart of God in my own heart, because then I, I pause and I say, but Lord, not, not till every heart that can be saved is saved. And so where we are is very close to the end of the story, friends. Where we are is in the midst of a massive global shaking that does not look like it's going to have a quick resolution next week. How do we respond? We pray for a global awakening. We pray for the wonderful things that that Greg Laurie and many other churches are reporting. And I was saying last week that the number of hits on our website on on the prayer to receive Jesus Christ is thrilling. We pray for it. The people of God partner with God in what he is doing in this hour. We pray for mercy. Absolutely. We pray for mercy, especially regarding food shortages and famine and persecution around that. There are reports. I was talking to a friend in Voice of the Martyrs. There are reports that Food distribution is now being used uh, as a means of persecution against Christians in um, Muslim countries, to be frank. And so we pray. We pray for mercy for the world. We pray, especially regarding food shortages. And we cultivate right now a deep life in God that helps us with resiliency. With this idea of this is a dress rehearsal. Whoa, if that's true. If more birth pains are coming, then what needs to change in my life so that I am more ready for it? And I just feel like the question we need to sit with is, would we exchange, would I exchange, I need to sit with this, a few years of suffering for the greatest awakening the world has ever known, followed by the return of Jesus? What is it that I really want? What is it that has secretly captured our hearts? I think that's where we are now. 